Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest in the series of Simply Certification webinars. This is Andrew Gaines just introducing the session for you. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping to head off questions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website from tomorrow, uh, as will a copy of the slides. So you don't need to worry about jotting down anything uh, during the presentation. You can just enjoy the presentation and you'll be able to get the slides later. Um, I will just do the advert for next month's webinar. I normally plan to do that at the end of run out of time, so I'll do it first today. Uh, the webinar next month is on the 20th of April, slightly later in the month because of Easter. And our topic next month is hydrogen CHP, so that should be interesting. Uh, but today's topic is streamlined energy and carbon reporting. We've got Jerry Finley presenting. Jerry is one of our ESOS lead assessors. He's got uh, 17 years experience in the energy sector and she was previously a project manager for a verification body and she's been a lead auditor for a number of ISO standards. So I think we're in for an interesting presentation today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jerry. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for thank you for joining me on my second streamlined energy and carbon um, workshop and presentation. Um, what I'm hoping to look at with you today is <clears throat> what SECA is, if the businesses how the businesses qualify for SECA, and because SECA is focused on carbon footprinting, this might be familiar to a lot of you, but some of you it might not be the basics of carbon footprinting terminology you need to know um, and then what happens after what happens after year one what needs to happen for year two etc and then looking at an open floor where i'd like your questions experiences and looking at how we can all work together to make sure our sectors are robust repeatable comparable and mainly consistent so just to give you a little bit of an introduction to myself and sustainable footprints um, Sustainable Footprints was founded in 2009. Our primary product what at the time was carbon footprinting, hence the name. Um, we focus very much on organisational carbon footprint quantification, analysis and reduction strategy. Since we started, we've grown not only in size, but in breadth of products and offerings. So we do ESOS, energy efficiency surveys, ISO management systems, compliance and risk services, and we also provide bits of training. And our most recent addition has been our CENCALP, which we use for quantifying carbon footprints and energy. So the team we work with, we're made up of subbies, as a lot of the smaller businesses are. We bring together about 300 years experience to the table, and the guys we work with, I'm absolute, at my absolute pleasure to work with some of the experts and guys I work with. Um, they're not just good at their sub subjects, they're absolutely passionate. And we believe our clients' performance is our performance, and that's how we look to deliver. So, moving away from the introduction. So, what is SECA? So, as many of you have probably read, the Companies Act um, came. The Companies Act 2006, 2018 amendment came into force on the 1st of April, 2019. This requires all qualifying organizations to disclose their annual energy use and GHG emissions from activities for which they are responsible. In addition to the absolute energy and greenhouse gas emissions, organizations need to include at least one intensity ratio, what energy efficiency actions they've taken within that reporting period, and an outline of the methodology they have utilized. So the organizations are encouraged to ensure that all their information is aligned with financial years. This aids comparability and consistency across the reports. But it also, if you think these reporting burdens seem to be increasing year, year in, year out, we've had ESOS, we've had SECA, they're just increasing. So it makes the data collection and compilement of it a lot easier. The objective of a SECA statement is that has to go out in your annual report is that the readers of the emissions data should have a clear annually comparative understanding of the organization for which that emissions data is being reported and if how this will differ from the operations within the consolidated financial statements 
So again, you're looking at a kind of triple bottom line reporting. The key thing to be aware of with the SECA is the deadlines. So if your current reporting period is an April to March period, and last year you applied for the COVID extension, then you must be submitting your financial statement, including the second statement for your comp to company's house by the 31st of March, 2021. So the clock really is ticking. If you didn't apply for the extension and have already submitted this without your second statement, you will need to do this retrospectively and submit the amendment. If your financial year end follows the calendar year pattern, then you'll have up to nine months following your year end data to submit your financial statement, including the second statement to company's house. So as you all know, late or incorrect filing can result in fines or your company being struck off a register of the register. But another thing to bear in mind is that your director's report can be downloaded from company's house website by anyone at any time. Thus, potentially, it could negatively impact the perception of your organisation if it's not compiled well or just slapped in there. So as you go, go through this, really, the second really does very much follow the financial kind of accounting approach, savings Oxley approach to carbon footprinting. So how do we assess if you qualify, qualify yeah, how do we assess if your organisation meets the, qualify, the eligibility criteria? Well, if you're an LLP or a UK quoted company, you should already be reporting the greenhouse gas emissions as part of your return. Well, if you're a large unquoted company, you have to meet two of the criteria that you can see on the slide. This is actually very different from ESOS, where you only had to meet one. So the criteria, this looks very simple, but as I'm sure you're all aware, the devil is often in the detail, or in this case, the incorporation or consolidation point. So when we talk about consolidated financial statements, these are the financial statements of a group which the assets, liabilities, equity, income, expenses, and cash flows of the parent company and its subsidiaries are presented as those of a single economic entity. So group level reporting must follow the same consolidation route as that taken for your annual accounts. So when you're making your disclosure, you must not only take into account your own information, but also the information of any subsidiaries included in the consolidation. However, you have the option available to exclude from your report any energy or carbon information relating to a subsidiary where the subsidiary itself, as a standalone entity, would not qualify if reporting in its own account. This is very much a difference, a very different approach taken to that of ESOS where a small subsidiary of a parent company was not exempt, even when on its own, it would not meet the qualification criteria. We would all try and pull it out as de minimis, but as it stands on its own, there is no de minimis within SECA. Companies incorporated outside the UK are not required to include their energy and carbon information in the director's report under this legislation. This includes foreign parent companies of UK subsidiaries. Where the accounts are consolidated outside the UK, then each individual UK subsidiary will need to assess its eligibility and if required, compile its own statement. And remember, if you consume less than 40 megawatts of energy, you're excluded from the requirement to report any energy and carbon information. You should, however, put a statement to that fact within your annual report because the regulation is based on a comply or explain aspect. My apologies. So what needs to go into your carbon, your second statement? The second requires you to include the emissions for activities for which you are responsible, including as a minimum, those used for, um, as a minimum, the use of purchased electricity, the combustion of gas, or the consumption of fuel for the purposes of transport. Now, I've seen a number of cases where it's stated that you should include all of your scope one and two emissions only. However, 
This does not align with what the actual SECA requirements are. What you did for ESOS, um, which to reduce your administrative burden, we would ideally like to align it with, or with carbon footprinting best practice. So taking transport, for example, the SECA requirement states business miles reimbursement should be included. However, these are classified as scope three under the GHG protocol. And I have got a section where we're looking at scopes under the GHG protocol. Another example is refrigerants. These are classed as scope one. However, you do not require to report these as part of your SECA. When it comes to landlord tenant arrangements, which is often one of the biggest stumbling blocks for gaining data, the guidance clearly states that the party responsible for the consumption should take responsibility for reporting it under the legislation. So this does include consumption of energy in rented serviced areas or where the tenant would report on energy consumption despite not being directly responsible for its purchase. In the case of energy where submitted information is not available, reasonable estimates should be included. So this is where you would look to apply your assumption methodology and you would look to identify it as weak data. So I thought it would be useful within this just to go through some basics of carbon footprinting because SECA is effectively your organisational carbon footprinting with the addition of reporting your energy in kilowatt hours. So compiling a robust, repeatable and comparable organisational footprint, you will all go to sleep tonight with that in your head. It does take a little bit of thought and planning at the front end to gain the most effective results. However, the process can be broken down into six easy stages, excluding verification, which although I would always advocate it for SECA, is not required. So stage one, two and three are all about defining those boundaries, such as that consolidation approach, the geographical boundaries and what sources of GHG emissions are within your operation. It should be noted that the SECA um, that for SECA, the Climate Change Reporting Framework, CCRF, requires reporting on impacts from entities within the financial control boundary, categorised as part one, and the impacts from the associates reported as part two. I have some slides talking about control and what we mean by that coming up. This aligns with the GHG protocol, while also enabling emissions from investment in associates to be reconciled to entities within the consolidated financial statements. So this is where you'll often have your breakdown of different entities within that consolidation. It should support this. Stage four is about defining that quantification methodologies. It sounds really simple. A lot of reports I've seen when I've been doing ESOSs will just re reference ISO 50,001 or ISO 1464. That's not necessarily the best approach. It sounds simple, but you need to look at the conversion factors used. The Bayes conversion factors, also known as DEFRA, um, change most years. They're reissued in June. So there is changes to these. You need to be aware of them. You also need to be looking at documenting what assumptions are permissible and your data materiality. So this works towards ensuring this consistency of approach. Stage five, well, from my perspective, this is the fun part where you draw your information together and start seeing pictures and trends associated with your organization. This can actually be really revealing um, for wider elements of the business. So an example I can provide you with was from when I did my first carbon footprint. For energy consultancy, the consultancy spent more than 2 million on travel every year. But when we ran the figures through the viewfinder of a carbon footprint, we worked out that this figure was closer to 7 million due to employee and productive time. You can't drive when you're working. And at the same time, we applied hours and distance comparatively to Rosba. We looked at accidents. And we also looked at, at that time, um, how many trees would offset. Of it. This was back in 2008. So at this stage, you'll uncover a lot of gems, including data processing, gathering improvements and opportunities. So the last stage of your SECA is that statement and incorporating it into your annual director's report, which will be signed off by your director 
um, and the account accountants before filing with the HMRC. Some recent experience that we've had is a number of accountants aren't aware of SECA. It doesn't seem to have been publicised that well by clients. So it is definitely worth contacting your clients, as you, your accountants, as you start this process and telling them this is what's coming in. This is how we're doing it. It's going into your pack. Would you be happy to sign this off? So this next slide, I did put together to say this is some of the tools that we use when we do carbon footprint to help you compile your carbon footprint and support your second compliance. So the main one I would always say um, is the main tool you should use, it's always sustainable footprint. But for yourself, what the tools and documents you'll really need is the GHG protocol. It gives you a really good guidance. The ISO 1464 and your conversion factors. How these link together is the ISO 1464, like most ISOs, gives you a very robust framework. It's, it's like the skeleton. The GHG protocol figuratively puts the meat on the bones, providing more detailed methodology and explanations. It's a really great go-to point. And the last one is the, convert, the annually updated conversion factors from Bayes or DEFRA. And these, con these facilitate the conversion of your operational data into kilograms or tons of CO2e. So just for clarity, the DEFRA conversion factors are only for the UK. So if you're doing this for other countries, such as the Republic of Ireland, America, etc., you may wish to use more country-specific conversion factors from CEPA or the EPA, or as a basis, the IPPC can also provide these conversion factors. Another great source that links with these factors is there is a methodology paper um, produced in um, 2019 by, Def by Bayes for DEFRA on the methodology for how they arrived at a lot of this. And for those of you who really do deep dive into this, it's really worth reading some of those elements because it will help with that methodology, especially when you're having data collation issues. So the other key documents and tools listed on this slide, for me, form part of your carbon footprint. Some of the tools and templates are available for us um, if you don't wish to develop your own. We're always happy for people just to ask and have a brain pick. So this next section, I've developed it as terminology you need to know. I'm as guilty as the next person of often using popular terminology or jargon out of context. And when you're starting to look at doing the carbon footprint, especially when you're coming from an energy background or a different background where it often has a different element, it's really important to have a really clear, robust understanding of what we mean when we use, use these statements. So the first one I've pulled up has been scope and boundaries. Any of you guys who are doing ISO audits or something along the side will be aware of the standard. The scope deals with the activities, facilities and decisions, and the boundaries delineate any physical process or site limits and or the organisation. So just like with the financial accounting aspect of the annual return, the scope and boundary needs to be clearly delineated and documented. This forms the framework for the methodology. And if this is gotten wrong, it can severely impact your carbon footprint, which you're, you're reporting out in the public. So if you look at this as your ring fence for where you stop data reporting, otherwise, as I've experienced personally, you dive down a never ending rabbit hole and risk double counting an area where another organization is almost covering it, such as when an organization tends to look into supply chain or shared services. Excuse me, I'm just having having a drink. So the, the next the next section we look into is what we mean when we refer to greenhouse gases. Also known as GHGs, they're not just carbon. They also include those gases controlled under the Kyoto Protocol, which include carbon dioxide, sulfur hexafluoride, methane, nitrous oxide, nitrotrifluoride, 
hydrogen fluorocarbines and fluorofluorocarbons. I do feel I should take a bow after saying those. Um, but this is why we use the term carbon dioxide equivalent as a way of describing the different greenhouse gases in one common unit. With regards to the GHG scopes, in short, organisational um, emissions are batched into one of three scopes. The easiest way to understand this is to view it from the point of control. Control is often viewed as either financial, what you pay for, operational, what you manage, or equity share attributable to a percentage of a joint venture you may be part of. So scope one is where you have full control. So for example, a company car, you select the vehicle type, what fuel source it uses, how it's maintained, and the driver operation rules such as they require green, green, green driver training, etc. Scope three is where you have indirect control. So using the car example, this is where you reimburse your employees mileage for using their own private car for business purposes. This means you control the requirement for the trip to be made, but if your employee decides to drive a Prius or a Mustang, that's entirely their choice. Scope three emissions often also include water, waste, business trips, materials consumed, and your supply chain. Scope three is often where you will start dropping more into the life cycle analysis mentality. The anomaly of the groups is scope two, which is generally attributed to electricity, heat, or steam. The reason for this is that with natural gas, which is scope one, you directly burn the fossil fuel to generate the energy. Whereas the electricity um, you consume, uh, fuel is used to generate the electric, the fuel used to generate the electricity is burned elsewhere. So that element is out of your control. As we develop our clients' second statements and support reports, we advise clients to include, to a limit of practicality, all of scope one, which in my mind does include refrigerants, but isn't a requirement. Scope two, and those scope three emissions such as water consumption and waste and employee grey fleet or travel as a minimum. This way, it also looks to align more with what you're going to be doing with ESOS, even though ESOS doesn't require you to have water and waste, etc. So. So as you can see from the breadth, breadth of aspects covered, carbon is more than just energy. Yet a number of clients I've come across who see energy and carbon footprint as interchangeable terms is so much more common than you'd think. The definition of energy in physics, as I'm sure many of you already know, is the capacity of doing work. It's an input. The definition of an emission is that an emission is something that has been emitted, released or discharged. To put this into context, the refrigerants you utilise in your air conditioning system, which are cluster scope one, do not create work done, but are an emission that forms part of your carbon footprint. Second requires your organisation must use verifiable data where reasonably practicable. If verifiable data is not available, a reasonable estimate may be used. However, this needs to be documented, including how the estimate was made to ensure year-on-year -year consistency. If the need arises for past energy use and emissions figures to be amended, which it does, it, it does happen, the correct figure should be presented alongside the original figure, along with the rationale for change. So how we approach this is we have the main second statement and we have this supported with a background report that details all of this, all of this. So one of the biggest issues my clients experience is where to get the data from. This can be an absolute element of pain for anyone trying to pull, pull a carbon footprint or any data set together. So you'll often need input from a number of departments within your organization. But one of the things I found is actually accounts are always a great place to start as if they pay the bills, they'll ultimately know what's going out. So if you follow the pound, you'll find the CO, CO2E. 
I've used this term a few times, materiality. So unlike with ESOS, the 2013 and 2018 SECA regulations do not contain de minimis for an emission of GHG emissions or, or energy use. Now, best practice guidance does kind of accept a, an element of this. So emissions must not exceed two to 5% of the overall emissions for energy. With so many data sources, there's often going to be a high degree of that word again, materiality. This is otherwise known as data confidence. And believe it or not, this confidence level can be scored to give you a value of X tons of CO2 with a plus or minus of 10%. So you engineers in the audience will understand, you know, you have tolerancy areas of where's an acceptable plus or minus for what you're expecting. Being able to do this with your data going, this is acceptable data, this isn't, will also help you targeting. So the easiest way to look at this is as the good, the bad and the ugly in relation to data. Good data would be 12 months meter reads. This would equate to a confidence score of plus or minus 5%. Bad data would be six months of estimated electricity bills with at least with the last six months estimated on the basis of um, on this basis, equating to a confidence score of plus or minus 50%. By determining this materiality, it allows you to target data collection improvement activities and also justify if and when your carbon footprint goes up as improvements are made in data collection. It happens often the first year your carbon footprint, it looks great, and then suddenly it shoots up when you've suddenly got better quality data. Being able to justify that, especially as this is a public document, is really something you need to do. So one of the big requirements for SECA is the use of intensity ratios. As your SECA statement is publicly available, reporting only absolute tons of CO2E does not reflect your organization's performance effectively, or more to the point, fairly. For example, as a, as a widget maker, in year one, you report 100 tonnes of CO2e. In year two, you reported 150 tonnes of CO2e. However, in year two, you tripled the size of your business, both revenue and production wise. You're rightfully proud that your carbon footprint trip didn't triple in size also. But as you only report in absolute terms, all the public sees is your carbon trend line increasing year on year. For this reason, it's vital to get your intensity ratios right because they are a trigger point for a lot of your targets, etc. The terminology intensity ratio is another way of stating your business's KPI. So a trick to looking at how to develop an intensity ratio is look at what the wider business shows its success as. So this could be tons of CO2 per widget. Produced. This could be tons of CO2 per turnover. This could be tons of CO2e per employee. A construction company I've been working with recently have done tons of CO2 per developed site uh, meter squared or sold meter squared. A IT data center company I've recently worked with, we've been looking at tons of CO2 per load. There are a lot of ways of doing this. This also helps you baseline and measure against your industries. So with the intensity ratios, think it through, make sure it makes sense to the business as you'll be looking to set targets against these as part of your year on year activities. It can also be used as a tool to gain organizational buy-in for any carbon reduction projects or energy efficiency requirements you might have. The second compliance requirements state states that at least one intensity ratio must be included and that this one metric must express the business's annual emissions in relatable to a quantifiable factor that should be the most appropriate to the organization's activity and be relatable and meaningful to stakeholders. So you can't just get away with going, it's per turnover if that isn't relatable. Okay, so before I get into the home run, I must first apologize for including Buzz in this presentation, but when I started developing this section, I could not get this guy out of my head. 
So here he is making his debut cameo. So we're now at the stage where we've done the majority of the grunt work on the carbon footprint and second compliance activities. But there's still two key aspects that should be included in your year one report that will also impact on your subsequent reports. The first one is mandatory. And this is the energy efficiency actions taken. These can be anything from installing smart meters and energy monitoring tools, converting your fleet to electric vehicles, changing your maintenance plans or behavioral change programs through to capital investment projects, such as the installation of LEDs or variable speed drives. A lot of recommendations will have come out of your ESOS phase two reports. You can utilize these into this, but remember, the measures have to have been taken within the relevant financial year. The second one is voluntary. And while second reporting requirements cover emissions and energy information for the current and previous financial years, organizations are encouraged to set forward looking, ideally science-based emissions reduction targets and include statements to that effect within their second statement and supporting report. This statement need not be some need not be something intensive. Um, this statement need only be no more than something along the lines of our emissions reduction target is to reduce our tons of CO2e per product output for a scope one and two emissions against our 2020 baseline by 10%. Our current progress against this target has been reasonable with our expectation we will meet that target by 2025. Our managing director is responsible for this target. If your organization has developed net zero or any of those elements, this is where you tie it in. Another example of this could be to a target to improve data materiality or incorporate additional scope three elements into your carbon footprint, such as waste or water. In short, a target public, stating a tar target publicly shouldn't be intimidating if it is based on robust on a robust carbon footprint. The target should be smart and meaningful and can have the additional benefits of driving change and being publicly attractive. And remember, your targets can change as the business dictates. So what does this mean for year two onwards? Well, yes, folks. Annual carbon reporting and energy reporting is here to stay and we need to make this become business as usual because the reporting burden is probably only going to increase. You will eventually be required to show a five-year comparative. This is why it's important to get that process and methodology right from the outset for compiling and reporting your carbon footprinting. If you do not have a third party to undertake this exercise for you, Make sure you clearly document each step of your process for this, including where you got the data from and the assumptions applied. Try to keep it as simple as possible. Like a recipe, add six eggs, half a pint of milk, 10 grams of flour and cook for 20 minutes. Simple. And one thing I can guarantee is that when you revisit this exercise in 12 months time, if you have not documented your process deep enough and in simple enough terms, you will spend an exorbitant amount of time trying to remember or understand what you did last time. And finally, verification. SECA currently does not require you to have your carbon footprint verified. However, this may be something worth looking into for a number of reasons. Firstly, as a publicly available document, you and your stakeholders Want that may want that reassurance. Second, for your own sanity, an extra pair of eyes may give you reassurance that you've correctly herded all those cats into a robust carbon footprint. As we all know how easy it can get lost, it can be to get lost down that data gathering rabbit hole, especially when you're applying conversions and different algorithms into the original data you have. Or you may feel verification will give you an edge in the public's eye against your competition. There are a number of ways you can look at having your footprint verified. As an ISO based organisation, Spenal Footprints would always recommend going down, um, gain, gaining certification from a third party UCAS accredited certification body against ISO 1464. However, if you just want a fresh pair of eyes to give it a sense check, um, 
a business such as ourselves or a number of you on this call um, would be willing to utilise the 1464 standards principles to review it and compare it against. There are also other standards out there which can be utilised as carbon, such as the Carbon Disclosure Project, CMARS, the Carbon Trust or Accountability Standard, um, which use, which is a set of accounting principles applied for sustainability. The Sustainability Accounting Standards Board (SASB) framework, both of which are often utilised when within ESG reporting, so it helps make that bridge between the financial and the operational side. So that brings me to the end of the presentation aspect of the webinar. Um, I'd love to hear any questions you may have, and hopefully this was of use for you. Okay, thank you very much, Jerry. So um, there is a question function uh, you should be able to use to drop questions in. Um, so uh, I will try and uh, collect the questions for, for Jerry. Um, before we um, go into that, though, I do have a question myself, Jerry, if I can use Chair's prerogative. Um, you were talking on your last slide there about third party verification um, and talking about stakeholder confidence and so on. Um, the qualifying criteria for SEC are not quite as uh, strict as ESOS um, or rather are more strict in that you need two qualifiers not just one so that, that means there's probably less companies involved than involved with ESOS reporting but on the other hand this is an every year activity rather than once every four years. Um, with ESOS there is a, a, a regulated process for the person producing the report. There doesn't seem to be a SECAR. Do you have a, a view on that? Um, because SECAR comes under the um, financial HMRC regulations, it's, it's company's house. So it would just be as if your audited accounts were erroneous. That, that's where it would come. The checks and measures on it don't seem to be as strong out there at the moment. I think <clears throat> it might be a little bit more because it's a publicly available document that people can download. I think there might be a bit more push from that way. But at the moment, I don't honestly believe they're going to be pulling it apart. My, my experience from talking to accountants is a lot of accountants still aren't aware that they should have been talking to their clients about it initially. Um, the pool of people who have to comply is smaller than ESOS. However, this kind of reporting is only going to get more and more momentum. Um, we've seen, you know, the government's carbon budget come out. We've all seen, you know, how much, how many people are marketing on their net zero budgets and all their green credentials, et cetera, et cetera. This is all going to start linking up and it's all going to start rolling down downhill so even if a company doesn't have to completely comply with SECA at the moment starting to put that foundation work in as if they do then you, you're not going to you're not going to lose by doing that if you do it right and if you get it lined up as well it will also help you um cut through for ESOS as well because you're pulling much of the same data yeah Okay, thanks. Um, there, there are some questions piling in now, so I'll, I'll go to those. Um, the first two are very similar questions, so we can wrap it up in one question. Um, can you share a template of a typical report or suggest uh, a template or, or software that's available? Uh, one of the people asking the question has seen anything between a one-page summary to a 30-page document. Uh, and we'd like to know what you would suggest to go for. Um, we 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 actually we run our ASOS. Our SEC is very similar, actually. But if you look on the screen now, if you zoom in on the slide at the moment, you can see that's our one-pager template that goes into the annual accounts. 
and then what we do is we have a supporting analysis report which then can be used by the business for whatever they need to you know if they need to use it for marketing if they need to use it for further analysis if they need to use it for improvement opportunities so um if you want to give me a give me an email or drop me a contact i'm i'm sure we can have a have a chat about um what we can share without losing too much ip but it's 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 not hard to share the template we also often um we have a section on our website called the vault where we will often put free downloads template templates tools and brief sheets some of them we'll put on for a week and we'll announce it and then take it off to keep people coming um and we have put the template up there once or twice so people can download that free template but i would say a one-page template for your accounts and a background report supporting that okay thanks jerry and that's saying to generous offer on the templates through your website and contact details are there if you want to um ask jerry what she's happy to share uh okay moving on to the next question uh someone has asked if you could just uh re quickly repeat how refrigerants are treated refrigerants are not required for seca if you do want to include them obviously you'd make that statement within your methodology and um, there's two ways of <clears throat> doing the refrigerants calculation so the first one would be to basically if you use your fgas register and your maintenance things um, every time you get um one of the um, providers to come in and you know top up your air conditioning you record what that is and then um, through the IPPC or actually in the latest um, phase conversion factors you can put the kilograms updated and it will produce your carbon footprint the other way is the IPPC have a tool for leakage and what that does is that looks at the type of asset your air conditioning unit is so whether it's a large commercial air conditioning unit or a small one, and it looks at the refrigerant, you have the weight of the unit and the kilowatt hours of it, and it calculates a leakage rate. And again, you can find that with the IPPC. But if you want to ask me any questions on that, again, happy to share that one. Um, I might even look at putting that one up on the vault because it's publicly available from the IPPC. So there's no should be no copyright issues. But I'll double check into that. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, next question is: Does this procedure allow companies to include any offsite carbon offsetting in their submission? And if so, what mechanisms are there to ensure that they are legit? No, your your second compliance has to report the gross carbon. So you can't really take account for um, offsets or um the renewable energy side of it there is a bit of consultation at the moment about um you know how companies can show net but just for that very reason of being able to prove offsets which has been quite a contentious subject recently um it's not great practice to be trying to push that through. you can't for seca and ideally in your carbon footprint you would you definitely need to be reporting your gross and you can say this is how much we've offset and if we've bought things but um bought offsets and whatnot or renewable energy or you've developed um energy from waste and stuff like that but you need to be making it really clear the trick with any carbon footprint is keep it really transparent have your audit trails set up you know make sure you can literally follow the piece of string because then if there's a bit of methodology that needs to change you can follow that bit of string back and make sure it's changed all the way through so seca is no to doing it net you have to do it gross um but good carbon footprinting as long as you get that methodology clear so it's robust repeatable and comparable then you've yeah. just got to definitely apply okay thanks Sherry. um another question is can you clarify the boundary regarding llp and clients removing subsidiary companies to fall below the threshold for the need to comply 
you explain that further? Um, LLPs are currently, they have to report anyway. Um, with your subsidiaries, it is following that consolidation level. So with the, with the consolidation level, if you identify, if you do consolidated accounts, um, then you follow that same route. The reason being is your public accounts will say our turnover for this year was, I don't know, 20 million pounds. And if your carbon footprint says, but our carbon footprint was only 100 tonnes of CO2, they're not going to match. You want them mirroring and matching as much as much as you can. So when you read the majority of your consolidated um, accounts, you're not having to rewrite a, sec a separate scoping almost to go, but this is a little bit we've done with carbon. The more you can align those, the easier it would be. Where you can start dropping them out is, for example, like holdings companies are very easily to pull out or brand new companies. But again, it's making that statement. The consolidation part, which is outside of the UK, that's when each one acts as if it's a standalone organisation. If it's within, that's when you need to try and follow that and write it out in that methodology. Again, it's getting those clear structures. Did I answer that question or is did I divert us a little bit? Fortunately, we can't get a, a, a live response to that, but if the uh, person asking that question could um, let me know if, if that was answered okay. In, in the meantime, uh, Oh, we've got a yes. Answered okay. That was quick. Good. Thank you. Feel free uh, to come me any time if you want to um, have a chew around this a bit more. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. Um, one more question. Have you found it difficult in getting accurate carbon factors for imported heat, cool, cool electrical energy from CHP or CCHP net heat networks? And have you been able to verify the information? person asking the question has found it difficult to get accurate data from these networks, especially, especially distribution losses. Um, if, if I'm honest, it's not something I've come across a lot. Um, it's something I'd like to discuss probably offline a little bit more just because I haven't got a very succinct answer because um, there are some other areas you can pull conversion factors from, um, especially if you've got a link in with the EU ETS that might be useful. Um, if that person's happy to contact me offline, um, it's not something I've come across too much with. Um, but I'd like to have a chat around that a bit further with them. Okay, so again, please feel free to contact Jerry as she's suggesting up the contact details on the, on the screen. Um, Okay, here's a, a technical question on the actual reporting, um, making the comparison with ESOS, saying that there is a, a portal, the EA use for ESOS reporting, there's no equivalent for SECA, so um, no. who does it need to be issued to? No, this, this is because it goes in as part of your company's house, which is um, your financial director's report which is submitted by your accountants so um, is it the IBRAX I think it's the IBRAX system um, that your accountants will submit it through okay so, and I think related to that there's a question about a submission date is there a specific submission date um, the person asking the question has found people submit it after May or even later is there anything in the legislation that can Force the time scale. Oh, I wish, as a consultant, I wish. <laughs> um, no, the, it it follows your annual report. This this is very heavily a, the financial kind of rules that it follows. So it follows your company's house financial reporting rules, which is normally nine months. You've got up until nine months after your year end date to submit. Um, so. Hence why if you had a um, April to March um, reporting year and you applied for a three month extension, 
but last year was COVID, why it's due in March now. If you hadn't applied for that extension, it would have been due in December. Okay, thanks. And um, I think that's most of the questions. I, I used Chair's prerogative to ask the first question. I might do the same again and ask the last question, um, which is, as you were going through the presentation, there were several things you mentioned. Um, as you probably know, I'm involved quite a lot in ISO 14001 and ISO 50001 auditing. And I kept hearing things thinking, oh, um, the company had one of those certificates in place or one of those systems in place, uh, certified or not. They, they have that information readily to hand. To, you know, to what extent is this easier for companies that, that operate those sort of management systems that, that have them quantifying this sort of thing and reporting it and reviewing it regularly? It, it makes it significantly easy. You're already used to collating the data. So looking at ISO 50001, um, you might just want to enhance that a little bit for other areas, you know, if you want to bring in waste or um, your refrigerants and whatnot, but that might come under your 14001. But those companies that already have ISO, especially if it's in the environment one or the 50,001, especially the 50,001, it's a really great launch pad. You're collating the data, you're internally auditing and checking that data. You've already got your methodology documented. You've also got it checked by, if it's a UK certification body, you've also got it checked by there. You've also got targets and objectives. You've also got projects with smart targets that you're doing. The alignment is, is often baffling why people don't automatically just latch that on as part of their integrated management system. Again, stuff like this might be really heavy ended at the front end, but once you've got it in and you've got it right, it becomes business as usual and you move on to improving things as opposed to just surviving. You go to thriving as opposed to surviving. Great, okay. Um, but, uh... Sounds like a good uh, incentive. I, I'll keep that in mind when I'm talking to people. Uh, okay, I, so that would be the last question. There was one other question, but it's covered in my sort of wrap up statements. Just reminding everyone that a recording of this webinar and the slides will be available on our website. There's a webinar area. You should be able to find it. Um, it will be on the website from tomorrow. Um, just a reminder again next month's webinar is on the 20th of April on the hydrogen chp which hopefully most of you will find of interest and uh just thank you all again for participating i hope you found that as interesting as i did and as useful and uh see you all again figuratively speaking uh, next time thank you all very much thank you andrew